Hello, um, good afternoon. My name is Manu Davishankar. I'm an associate director in the energy systems team at Carbon Trust. I'm also the project manager for the flexibility in GB project. For this session, um, I will dive into some of the key insights uh, from this work and discuss the evidence for taking a whole systems approach for us to reach net zero. Now, to, um, uh, to expand on this session, um, I'm going to cover some of the, the key modeling insights from the project to, to, to kind of showcase the, the importance of taking a whole systems approach. Um, now, I will do this uh, by using uh, two case studies. The first one is on heat decarbonization, and the second one is on hydrogen development. And, and through taking these case studies, um, I will explore the impact of taking siloed decisions in the form of energy system impact, the overall cost, and also take you through the benefits of looking at it more holistically uh, using these two case studies as evidence. So uh, before we dive into the uh, into the analysis, um, I just give a quick uh, introduction uh, to the to the flexibility in GB project. Um, so the report, which is now publicly available on Carbon Trust website, um, has has a lot of details uh, relating to 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 um, the the role and value of flexibility in meeting the net zero targets, which is our uh, core research questions of this on this project. And in doing that, um, we have helped to create a robust evidence base uh, to support the continued deployment of flexibility technologies. Um, through this analysis, uh, we hopefully provide a direction to market and policymakers on the role of flexibility in, in reaching a cost-effective net zero transition. And we also go beyond the modeling to explore the business models and other key enablers that are required for flexibility uh, to make them deliverable and viable in the next 30 years. Of course, this project uh, could not have been done without the support of the project partners, uh, whose, whose logos you can see below on this slide, and also uh, uh, our strategic partners, Imperial College, whose integrated energy system models uh, has been used to kind of underpin the analysis and the evidence that we'll um, be sharing today. So, um, uh, before I guess we dive into the into the results, it's it's useful to set up how the how the modeling was 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 analyzed. Um, so we took a scenario based approach to modeling the role and value of flexibility. Uh, this is because the uncertainties in energy system development uh, in the next thirty years towards net zero. So we chose the heat decarbonization strategy as the main aspect to differentiate the three key scenarios. And therefore, you see uh, there is a hybrid heating scenario, there's a full electric heating scenario, and of course, there's a hydrogen heating scenario. For each of these core scenarios, we carried out a whole systems analysis, uh, looking at high flexibility deployment and low flexibility deployment uh, to then work out the, the system cost and other implications. So this uh, not only allows us to understand how much flexibility and what type is required, but also the implications for generation capacity, carbon negative technology requirement, network investments, and, and so on. As you can see, we have looked at a range of flexibility technologies. Uh, these include interconnectors, uh, battery storage across different levels. So batteries in homes to batteries on the networks, uh, pumped hydro plants, thermal storage, again, thermal storage sitting on district heating networks and thermal storage in the form of hot water tanks sitting in buildings and also demand set response, which itself constitutes um, several sources of, of, of flexibility and, and technologies, including smart appliances, uh, flexibility from electric vehicles, both V1G, uh, that is smart charging, and V2G, where electricity can be passed from the vehicle uh, into, the, into the system. And as I said, the, given there is, uh, I guess, so many uncertainties that you know we cannot have a deterministic future of, of what the 2050 energy system um, would exactly look like, we took a range of sensitivities um, uh, to kind of explore um, uh, these, these uncertainties. So for example, we looked at the hydrogen production route and um, the impact of relying on one or, or kind of multiple hydrogen production routes. Um, and also looked at uh, how uh, the, the hydrogen and the power system can be coupled via technologies such as hydrogen turbines and electrolyzers. We looked at the impact of um, unavailability of negative emission technologies like CCS and, and uh, direct air capture. And we'll come back and revisit some of these analysis in the in the presentation today. Um, given there is a range of flexibility technologies, uh, as, as I've just mentioned, we also looked at the impact of flexibility technology availability. So what happens if we do not have a demand side response? What happens if batteries become more expensive than, than we think they, they, they might get? Um, and, and also, you know, what happens if we cannot deploy the levels of thermal storage required? 
We also look at uh, another key uh, aspect of, of uh, systems modeling, which is um, what is kind of local benefit and what is national benefit and how do we find a balance between the two? And finally, we also looked at uh, having a zero and a net negative um, carbon target for 2050 to look at the implications for the energy system and also for the whole system cost. Now, as this presentation is about a whole systems approach, we will kick off looking at some of the important system level linkages between uh, some of the key elements required to achieve net zero. Now, this is quite a simple graphic and it outlines four of those key elements on the outside. So starting from the top left and, and kind of going clockwise, we start with hydrogen. So what are the key strategic questions there? You know, how do we decide how to produce hydrogen, i.e. what technologies we use and how much of this hydrogen gets used in the energy system? And going to the next uh, key element, which is heat decarbonization. Uh, what choices do we make on how to decarbonize the, 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 the future of heating? So we examined you know, three, three options potentially, electrification, hydrogen, or hybrid. And then coming down to the third key element, which is carbon negative technology. What type and how much of carbon negative technologies like carbon capture and storage um, will we need and should we develop? And finally, uh, finishing the circle, uh, coming to flexibility. How much and from where do we source flexibility for the system? So all of those four key elements link back to the energy system infrastructure right in the center of that figure. Now this energy system infrastructure consists of generation, transmission and distribution primarily. So significant infrastructure investment would be required here in this, in this element to successfully make the transition to net zero. So therefore we need to think very carefully and be very confident in what decisions that we take on how much investment is required on this, uh, on this infrastructure. So let's then move to the first case study. Let us start by looking at the relationship between heat decarbonization, uh, energy systems, uh, and then carbon negative technology. As you can see, the two other areas have been, uh, have been grayed out. So we're only looking at uh, this part of the system and we'll gradually bring in other elements to understand the implications of partial and complete whole systems consideration using the results from the modeling as evidence. So what this chart shows is that there is significant energy system implications. We are using here uh, the generation capacity as a key indicator of, uh, of the impact different heating decarbonization strategies um, can have. I mean, the first point to make straight away is that Regardless of the heat decarbonization strategy, there is a big scale up of system that is required uh, in the future from where it is now. As you can see, the present day system is, is, is around 103 gigawatts and we're using the 2019 uh, data to represent the present day. What we can also gather is that there is some consistent scale up in some generation technologies required, particularly renewables. We can see that there is consistently high deployment of offshore wind, around 120 gigawatts, the kind of blue, blue stack in the middle across all the columns, uh, across the three uh, heating pathways. Similarly, PV, the kind of yellow stack, uh, there is between about 37 and 47 gigawatts of PV that, um, that the model considers optimum across these scenarios. Now, this already raises quite an interesting insight, which is the linkage between how much and what type of renewables we need and the choices that we make on heat decarbonization. Now, these technologies need to be deployed in multiples in terms of capacity of what we currently have. So for example, we need about 10 times the amount of offshore wind and about uh, kind of three to five times uh, the amount of PV in the future. These are significant um, scale up efforts that are required. Now, the second key insight is there are capacities that are actually quite sensitive to what heat strategies that we take. And, and in this, we look at gas generation. Now, gas generation capacities are very important because they give support during peak periods, but actually the optimal level depends on what heat scenario they have, um, the, what heat scenario we choose, I'm sorry. But this is also critically reliant on the availability of CCS infrastructure. Because in 2050, remember that we are in a net negative or a net zero uh, system, which means that any positive emissions needs to be offset with a negative, negative carbon um, uh, technology, such as, as you know, CCS or DAX. Now, if these were not available, it is important to have an alternative source of firm dispatchable power because the system need does not really go away. This highlights the importance of the link between carbon negative technologies 
the energy system infrastructure and the heat decarbonization strategy. So now that we looked at that, um, the, the first order uh, linkage, uh, let us now bring in system flexibility into the decision-making picture and explore the implications. So what we're looking at here is really the difference in generation capacities once flexibility is co-developed to the energy system to meet heat decarbonization strategies. So what that means is that the model is, is allowing uh, flexibility to influence what the optimal energy mix is rather than forcing it into a static energy picture. This is the key importance of, of whole systems thinking. Now, as we can see from the charts, there is significant change in both the total capacity but also the type of technology that gets replaced, uh, particularly in the case of, of, of electric heating. Now we can actually see from the hydrogen heating and the hybrid heating scenarios, which is the first and the third column, that between 51 to 65 gigawatts are actually reduced once flexibility is added to the system. These are primarily gas plants with a smaller amount of other technologies, including renewables, which essentially are deployed more effectively once there is flexibility added to that decision-making picture. Now, this highlights the importance of considering flexibility together simultaneously with the heat decarbonization strategy and the wider energy system to ensure that we can transition cost-effectively. And what this shows is the counterfactual. If we do not do that, we might end up building additional generation infrastructure leading to a most, more expensive system for everyone, but still that delivers the same services in terms of heating and still is able to meet the, the, the carbon target. Now, the other key aspect of energy infrastructure is the distribution network infrastructure um, uh, of, of the system. So what we see here is the difference to the peak demand on the distribution network if additional flexibility is considered together with the heat decarbonization strategy and wider system development. Now, as peak demand is a really good proxy for network investment, we can see that this need is considerably lower uh, um, if, if, if flexibility is co-developed with the strategy. Now, this again is important, important evidence to rationalize the value of taking a more whole systems approach to deliver the heat decarbonization challenge much more cost effectively. Now, what we see here is, is essentially a summary of the whole system cost difference across the three core heating scenarios with and without the consideration of flexibility. And what we see here is the translation of the reduced need for the generation and the distribution networks that we saw in the, in the, in the last few slides, turning into annual cost savings in 2050. Thus, considering flexibility together with heat decarbonization allows us to take much more effective decisions on the energy system, saving us between, on the lower end, about 9.6 billion pounds per year in the hydrogen heating scenario to the upper end, which is 16.7 billion pounds per year in the electric heating scenario. Another important note to add here is that the lower cost relative in the hydrogen heating and the hybrid heating scenario is due to the inherent flexibility that is available in those systems. For example, in the hybrid heating systems, we can use gas boilers as backup when there is peak demand alleviating pressure on the electricity system. Similarly, on the hydrogen system, you can produce hydrogen and store it and use it uh, when there is demand or, or uh, yeah, when there is demand. Um, now, while the modeling considers these to be delivered automatically, these actually in reality require very careful planning, design and operation from a whole systems perspective. Uh, looking at these cost savings, you know, you might agree that these are significant numbers and, and really rationalize why a systems approach is critical. Let us now turn back to the, the system linkage graphic and, and, and pick up our second case study example. So, as we did in the first case study, we will explore the implications of partial and more complex whole systems approach. And this time we'll be focusing on the use of hydrogen uh, across the system. So what we see here is from left to right, we are essentially looking at progressively greater system considerations and its implications on energy infrastructure and whole system cost. So what we will do in the next few slides, we will start looking at hydrogen for heating uh, the, the first column on the left, essentially, without carbon negative technologies or flexibility considerations. Then we will move on to uh, bringing CCS, um, uh, uh, carbon negative technologies, into the fold, but still be operating in a low flexibility future. Finally, 
we will end up with looking at what happens when we consider hydrogen for heating, CCS infrastructure and flexibility, and of course the wider energy system together in a whole systems approach to kind of understand the implications of this. We will again um, uh, revisit this chart at the end of the case study. So um, as I said, let us start off with examining the, the system impact and the total cost of a hydrogen dominant system. So here in this scenario, hydrogen is used um, as the primary heat decarbonization strategy. Also, it has other uses such as uh, uh, heavy, heavy transport and, and industry. Now, in this scenario, we are only focused on hydrogen development. It does not have CCS technology available. Now, because this uh, CCS technology is not available, it limits how hydrogen can be produced. And so it relies completely on electrolyzers, which of course use electricity to convert, uh, I guess, water to, to, to hydrogen. This has significant uh, implications on the energy system as the required amount of electricity and also then the generation capacity and the networks to support transmission and distribution is also significant. As there is no CCR infrastructure available, it is actually not possible for the energy system to go down to negative emissions. So actually there is a relaxation of carbon targets and it can actually only deliver uh, zero emissions, which of course in itself is a challenge. Now, this also means that the supply needs to be zero carbon, which then drives significant offshore wind capacity, which is 220 gigawatts in this scenario. Now this is a hundred gigawatts higher than any other scenario that we've modeled. The implication of this is of course, the system cost then rises to about 124.5 billion pounds a year. And actually we can see the two big cost components, uh, the one in light blue and the one in green. The one in light blue, of course, is the capital investment that is required to scale up this electricity generation to feed electricity into the electrolyzers uh, and, and the capital investment into the hydrogen electrolyzers themselves, which is uh, signified in the, in, in the green stack. Now let's uh, start bringing um, uh, carbon capture uh, into, into the picture, because what we looked at previously was taking isolated hydrogen production decisions uh, on the energy system infrastructure without considering CCS. Now let us bring CCS into the picture and examine the implications. So the, the two charts uh, show the, 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 the infrastructure implication and also the resultant cost impact of co-optimizing CCS together with hydrogen production and use. So it is not um, it is not forcing CCS into a static future, but actually co-developing how much carbon capture and storage is required based on how much hydrogen is optimal in the energy system. Now, straight away, we can see that this has a tremendous impact both on the generation capacity that is now optimal and the resulting whole system costs. Having CCS allows for a significant reduction of the renewable capacity. Actually, you can see here that the offshore wind capacity reduces by 100 gigawatts. The PV capacity reduces by 20 gigawatts. And actually the, the hydrogen combined cycle gas turbines is also reduced by another 60 gigawatts. This is a significant rebalancing of the optimal generation portfolio, which could not have been landed on without the co-optimization of CCS with hydrogen production. The system cost difference chart on the right now picks up this cost decrease due to the capacity reduction. Now this itself uh, accounts for about 15 billion pounds of cost savings a year in 2050. We can also see that there's an overall net decrease in the hydrogen production cost. This is due to having a mixture of production methods which are more cost effective rather than just relying on electrolysis. This overall leads to a net decrease in the whole system cost of around um, 19 billion pounds per year in 2050, which of course is quite a material cost reduction. Again, this number rationalizes the value of a systems approach. So now that we've seen uh, the, the implications of, of, of looking at uh, carbon negative technologies, uh, CCS, together with hydrogen and heat decarbonization and implications for the energy system infrastructure, let's also now bring flexibility into the picture and see the implications of, of a truly whole systems approach that considers all of these elements together. So this is a similar chart that we saw two slides ago, but this time we're looking at the system and cost implications uh, of, of, of hydrogen essentially from a systems perspective. Again, what we see here is a significant rebalancing in the generation capacity with a total of around 64 gigawatts um, being, uh, uh, being further reduced. This is predominantly PV, but it also includes um, uh, other technologies such as uh, gas 
which is now delivered uh, kind of more uh, more effectively. Apologies, it's predominantly gas, but also includes uh, PV, which is delivered more um, more effectively. Now, from a cost perspective, we can see that this capacity reduction also gets translated into cost reduction uh, by around uh, 5 billion pounds per year in 2050. We also see the reduction in network investment. Now, this is driven by the peak demand reduction and shifting that is, uh, that is delivered by having technologies such as demand side response in the flexibility portfolio. Thus, the addition of flexibility provides a net cost saving of 9.6 billion pounds per year in 2050. So bringing all of this analysis together in this case study, we see that the annual cost saving that is enabled by taking a whole systems approach to hydrogen. The first step down uh, is the consideration of a CCS infrastructure together with hydrogen production and use. And as you can see, that leads to a 16% cost saving. And the second step down in terms of cost that is between the second and the third column is, is also then considering flexibility, CCS, hydrogen production, together with the wider energy system infrastructure, leading to a 9% cost saving. As seen in the face, uh, first case study, these are again quite material cost savings across the system that can be realized if we co-optimize and take a whole systems approach to all the key elements of the energy system to reach net zero cost effectively. I'm gonna quickly summarize some of the key messages as we've gone through quite a, quite a number of different outputs from the analysis. So the first is it is important to understand that any heat decarbonization pathway to net zero has significant system impact to make it secure and deliverable. Simultaneously accounting for the energy system and flexibility is critical to ensure that the heat decarbonization is done as cost effectively as we can. Turning to hydrogen, the hydrogen production strategies developed in isolation of carbon negative technology pathways risk making hydrogen scale up prohibitively expensive and potentially technically unfeasible as well. Similar to the heat decarbonization uh, case study, joint up strategies between system infrastructure, flexibility, carbon negative technologies is critical to allow the cost effective scale up of hydrogen. Finally, greater whole systems thinking is critical for effective net zero planning and really needs to be embedded into all aspects of uh, system development. And I would like to say that um, uh, I would really welcome uh, people. Uh, that was the end of the presentation. Uh, but if you want to uh, get more details, I would really encourage uh, everyone to, to go to our website and, and download the flexibility in GB report. Um, uh, essentially, it, it covers a lot of detail, but maybe quickly to give you a summary so that uh, you, you have the context before you pick it up, is that the chapter one provides uh, essentially an overview of the current energy system and actually introduces the different forms of flexibility that we saw. You know, there's, there are many different technologies that have been considered in these analysis, each with their unique characteristics um, and, 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 and kind of cost points. Chapter two essentially describes the, the IWES model from Imperial. And also the scenarios, if you want to understand the, the, the different scenarios and the sensitivities undertaken, that chapter gives you a lot of information about that. Now, chapter three really goes deep into all the results of the IWES modeling and, and essentially provides evidence to rationalize the value of flexibility under various energy system futures. But there is also a lot of uh, analysis and data on how exactly uh, this value is being delivered. Chapter four goes beyond modeling, takes the modeling results and understands you know, how much needs to be deployed of flexibility by 2030 and actually examines a range of barriers, quite a holistic analysis uh, um, using deployment readiness index to understand the barriers that, that uh, these different flexibility technologies might be facing. Chapter five essentially sets out the key uh, recommendations for further research. So people who are really interested in this area uh, will hopefully find it useful uh, about you know, which part of the scope that we were able to cover and some of the questions that we would like to but definitely uh, is, is, is a priority for further research. There's also a set of appendices that will be um, uh, available for download in the next few days, and they'll contain a lot more detail on all the model inputs uh, and also the kind of evidence collected for us to come to an assessment of, 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 of um, how severe the barriers are and what actions needed to be taken. So for people who are really interested in the detail, uh, we, we aim for this report to be as transparent and accessible as possible, so you'll find all the information there. If you, of course, have uh, any further information, please do get in touch with the Carbon Trust, and we're very, we'd be very happy to discuss this with you in further. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much.